Thank you, choir, for leading so beautifully. And again, thank you for being here today and allowing the Spirit of God to be in this place. You know, each week I try to share a little funny, a little humor. It was funny that this week I received the same joke from two different church members, and I've already told this joke before. But the funny thing is, people laughed at the early service, so I'm going to tell it again, and you might remember it, or maybe you don't. But there was a story about a, a new pastor who was visiting uh, some of his parishioners, and he went to the homes of one of his members, and, and there he was knocking on the door, and it was obvious that someone was at home, but yet no one came to the door, and after knocking for a good while, he took out a business card and he wrote on the back Revelation 3.20 and he placed it in the door and he left. The following week at church, after the uh, offering was being counted, and he found his card in the offering plate that someone had placed it back in the plate with the cryptic message, Genesis 3.10. Well, he got out his Bible and he looked up that passage, that reference, and he began to laugh hysterically. You see, when he wrote Revelation 3.20, it was, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Genesis 3.10 was, I was in the garden, and I heard your voice, and I was afraid, for I was naked. I don't think you all laughed the first time I shared that <laughs> joke. If there was one thing you needed more of today, what would it be? Ask yourself that question. If there was one thing I needed more of today, what would it be? Now, some of you all would say, more money. I need more money. But I'd be willing to say that most of you would say more time. I need more time. It seems that we're living in a society where people are fatigued and frazzled and, and just uh, overwhelmed by the overload of our schedules. I mean, people are exhausted and, and people are, again, burdened and they are hurried by an overcrowded schedule. And so many of you or so many of us are here today and we don't know if we're coming or we're going or we meet ourselves coming or we meet ourselves going. And for whatever reason, in our culture today, the culture has tricked us in believing that busyness equals importance. Not only are we trying to keep up with the Joneses, we're trying to stay ahead of the Johnsons. And we're all the time on the go. Maybe today, the Lord is gonna place on your heart and mine the need for us to make some changes. Some changes in our crazy busy schedules, some changes in our family priorities, some changes in our spiritual life, because look, if we keep up at the frantic pace in which we're living right now, sooner or later, it's going to take a toll on our health, it's going to take a toll on our families, and ultimately it's going to take a toll on our soul. So today as we come to the second part of this great series, I'm one of the most well-known, one of the most quoted passages of Scripture and all of God's Word, the 23rd Psalm, we learned last week that it was not young shepherd boy David who penned these words, but more likely seasoned, life-experienced King David who penned these words to encourage you and to encourage me as we go through this thing called life. And today I pray that these words would resound in your heart and in mine and that we would first find rest. That we would first find rest. Last week we learned that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. And then 
Today he makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Well, when my children were young, my wife and I would make our children lie down for a, a nap or to uh, go to bed at appropriate time. And that was a time, I know my wife Kelly used to love nap time because that was a time that she would get a lot of things done around the house, you know, uh, the laundry or dish or whatever it may be. And she would put the children, make them, even when they didn't want to, they would have to, to lay down, they'd have to lie down for a nap. It was so funny because our, our first child, Isaiah, she made Isaiah take a nap till he was 15 years old. And I really think he was five. But the fact is, as our children uh, began to come, uh, I found out that, that the girls did not want any part of nap time. And so I don't think Aunt Catherine ever had a nap time. But, but why does the shepherd make the sheep lie down? Because he knows what they need. Why do we as parents do what we do for our children? Because we're trying to meet their need. And when it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, well, green pastures were not the, the common uh, terrain in the region of Judea. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the land around Bethlehem was rough and rocky. In order for there to be, uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures, the only way there were going to be green pastures is if the shepherd removed uh, thorns and bushes, burned the brush, removed the rocks. Uh, the only way it was going to be a green pasture if the shepherd did his work. As a matter of fact, uh, a literal translation would be that, that the shepherd makes his sheep lie down in his finished work. And that's exactly what the good shepherd Jesus Christ has done for you and me. With his nail-pierced hands, he has removed the thorny underbrush of condemnation, and he has removed the big boulders of sin, and he has made a pasture for our soul. To lie down in a restful pasture for our souls. I think about other references found in Ezekiel 34, 14 that, that God said, I, I will tend to them in a good pasture. They will lie down in a good grazing land. David said in Psalm 62, 1, I, I find my rest in God alone, for he is the one who brings salvation so today, if, if you're trying to find peace and rest in anything else but the Lord Jesus Christ, you are never going to truly be at rest. You're always going to be searching. You're always going to be looking. I remember as a child, and again, this is before young people, all the electronics, we talked about that a few weeks ago, before all the, all the iPhones and smartphones and, and iPads and and all the video games or NBA 2, all that, we had to go out and play games, make them up as well. I remember tall grass down in Springfield, Kentucky, next to our house. And I remember it the same way down in Campbellsville, Kentucky, at my grandparents' house. Do y'all remember that? I don't even know what kind of richer you might know what kind of grass it was. But you could go lay down in it and it would make a fort. It would stay down. And so we would have forts in the tall grass. And I remember I, I would just find myself just lying down, looking up at, at the sky and the birds, and it, and it was so peaceful, you know, to make a fort in the grass. And I remember that my brother, we would play, you know, and a neighbor would try to find us, and I would just be, you know, then when I'd come in, my mother would check me for ticks. But, but I, remember, I remember how enjoyable I was just sitting by... And I was just thinking about when we put our trust in the Lord and we rest our souls in Him, He gives us that kind of peace. We just fall back and say, 
Lord, it's in your hands. It's out of my control. I just trust in you, and I'm basking in your goodness and in your glory. And maybe today the Lord is saying, you need to slow down, and you need to rest, and he will bring you that peace. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. We're going to call this responsibility. The shepherd was responsible for leading his sheep. Uh, the shepherd did not get behind them and prod and poke and go, yeah, go, ha, ah, come on, go on, you all go on. I told you last week, sheep aren't real smart. They're real simple. They're not real bright. So they need someone to lead them. The shepherd leads his sheep beside quiet waters. In other words, that, that's a place again to where they can find nourishment. And when he leads them, he's saying, look, I, I've got a better place for you all if you'll just follow me. And I think about us following the lead of the Holy Spirit and the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. So many times we think we know what's best for us, but the shepherd knows what's best for his sheep. And so we go to the Lord to give us wisdom and guidance to know which way we ought to go. Hebrews 4.16 talks about a high priest who has gone before us, which is referring to Jesus Christ. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we might find mercy and find grace to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And if there is ever a time that we are in need, it's today. We all have needs. We all have worries. We all have fears. We need someone to lead us. But yet Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53, 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us have turned to his own way. And guess what? There are a lot of people that are turning away from the good shepherd and from the flock or the fold. There are a lot of people that are making everything else priority over relationship with God or priority over the time that they give God in worship. A Gallup survey had this startling statistic that only 50% of Americans are members of a church. In 1999, 70% of Americans were members of a church. So we have already dropped 20%. And they attributed this to the fact that today, there's a growing percentage of people that have no faith or no religion whatsoever. So it's dropping those numbers. No wonder shepherds, pastors of churches are feeling overwhelmed and discouraged because sheep are leaving the flock, leaving the fold. And I think about what was written by Lance Witt in a book that I was sharing with my staff called Replenish. Hear these startling statistics. Every month in the United States of America, 1,500 pastors are leaving the ministry permanently. 1,500 a month are leaving the ministry permanently. 80% of pastors and 85% of their spouses are discouraged in their role in their ministry. Over 50% said if they can make a living doing something else other than ministry, they would already be out of ministry. 71% of pastors feel discouraged to the point of being burnt out and overwhelmed to the fact that um, they are ready to, again, drop out. They find themselves in deep depression, not only on a weekly basis, but a daily basis. Now I want to tell you this. I, I can feel the pain. 
I'm human. We as ministers are human. You know, we're, we're, we get discouraged. We, we get down. Let me ask you, if you're a doctor and you notice that you didn't have any patients in your waiting room, would you be concerned? If you were a dentist and you had no patients out in the waiting room, would you be concerned? If you're a school teacher and you had no pupils in the classroom, would you be concerned? If you were a restaurant owner and you had no patrons eating in your restaurant, would you be concerned? Absolutely you would be concerned. I'm concerned. You know why I'm concerned? Because I see the toll the world is, is taking on our families. Did you know that only 42% of millennials, that's people born between 1980 and 2000, did you know only 42% of millennials are members of a church? And we, we're going to see that number continue to go down. And let me tell you why I've been concerned. God has blessed this church in such a mighty way over the years. I've reminded you and myself that we never grow complacent and think, oh, we've arrived. God, God is what? Look at our beautiful facility. Look at the beautiful cross. It's been great. And then when I look out and see empty seats where people used to sit, it, it concerns me. What really concerns me is we prepared numbers for our annual associational meeting of the Franklin Baptist Association. I was pleased, but yet also challenged that we had, and this number starts back in October, from October to the end of September, we had 66 people to make professions of faith and be baptized. Now that's okay, but it should be many more. We had 61 other additions, that means people that were already Christians that, that joined our church maybe from another church. That's, that's, that's great, too. We welcome everyone. But this is disheartening. Three years ago, this church averaged in our worship attendance on Sunday morning, that's 8.30 and 11, we averaged 1,050 people. You know what we're averaging this year? 850. Where have those 200 people gone? Did you know on any given Sunday, we fluctuate 200 to 250 people on any given Sunday. What's wrong with that picture? It concerns me that the world is pulling us away from God's church. The church coming together with the family is no longer priority. So what, what do we do about it? What, what can we do? Well, certainly we can pray. We can pray for great revival and spiritual awakening that people would see the, the need for Jesus Christ in their lives. You know, sometimes people say, we just, we just watch it at home on live stream. I'm glad we offer live stream for shut-ins, for elderly people traveling. But for people that are perfectly healthy enough to be in God's house, I just sometimes want to cancel live stream so they have to come to some church service. Because people say, you know what? Well, you're just worried about numbers. No, I'm not. I'm worried about souls. Every one of those numbers represent a soul. Did not Jesus in Luke 15 give the parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son? And did not Jesus say that the shepherd left the 99 to go look for that one lost sheep? We are to be concerned and brokenhearted for those sheep who have gone astray and to do our part. It can't be just one shepherd, two shepherds, three shepherds. We all need to do our part in caring for the flock and letting them know they are loved and letting them know they are missed. A few weeks ago, and I shared this on Wednesday, I tried to meet people where they are by texting them on their phone. Everybody always has their phone. You can't go to get your oil changed, you can't go to a doctor, you can't go anywhere that there's nobody talking anymore, everybody's just on their phone. Sometimes, you know, you just get out your phone because you feel like, I just want to be like everybody else. I'm, gonna just, I'm not really looking at anything, I'm just looking at my screensaver, but I look important because I'm always on my phone. And I sent out a text to people 
recently. Maybe you were one of them that received it. And I said, hey, we've been missing you at church. I just want you to know we love you and we miss you. Is there anything that I or we as a church can do to minister to you and your family more effectively? And the majority of the responses were very kind. Thanks for checking on us. We've had sports. We've had travel ball. Uh, we've just gotten out of the habit. Uh, we've had this going on, that going on. Thanks for reminding us. Hope to get back in the swing. Hope to see you all soon. And then I had someone to respond to this. We run and are on the go all week long. The only day, we're, we're at work Monday through Friday, Saturday at sports all day. The only day we can sleep in is Sunday. The only day we can sleep in is Sunday. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a, a rocket scientist, but could you not sleep in and get to church by 11? I don't know what sleeping is. When I grew up, if we slept past 7.30, my dad said, half the day has gone. <laughs> get out of that bed. You're sleeping your life away. <clears throat> to say one hour out of your week for the Lord is not asking too much or two if you come to Bible study. But this is a trend, and here's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the future of my children, your children, your grandchildren, that one day the church, not just this church, the church may close its doors because that's how things are trending, away from corporate worship, away from faith in Jesus Christ. Do whatever you want, anytime. Whatever feels good, do it. And the devil is pulling a lot of people away. And I want you and me to know that we have a responsibility to lead by example. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Choose this day whom you will serve. And I pray you would choose to serve the Lord. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me. See that picture? He leads me beside those quiet waters. He restores my soul. We're going to call this restoration. Restoration is revived, renewal, refreshes. Uh, it's such a Beautiful picture. He restores, he restores our soul. I think about what David said in Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. Or little translation could be, be still enough. No, acknowledge that I am God. Would you be still and say enough to everything else and I'm going to just know that he is God and he's got me and he's got my family and he's in control even when I feel like everything is falling apart and I'm on the go and I'm frenzied and frazzled and hurried and burdened and exhausted. He's in control. Be still and know that he is God. But I think if you're here today and you say, I'm running, I'm running low on energy, I want to tell you he can refill you. If you're here today and you think, I'm, I'm losing all my hope, he can replenish you. Isaiah 40, 31, but those who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall soar on wings like eagles, run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not be faint. If you're here and you are lonely or depressed, know he can remind you that he is with you and with me always. Matthew 28, 20, the end of that great commission. And surely I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And then if you're here and you're lost without Christ, he can save you. He can bring restoration into your life. But you have to open the door. 
He's a shepherd that leads, but he's not a shepherd that's going to kick your door down. He's not going to kick the door of your heart down. He wants us, he has that power and authority, but you know what he does? He convicts us by the Holy Spirit. So we open the door and let him in. And he wants to come into your life and your crazy schedule so much today. And I want to tell you, I'm preaching to myself. I'm not just preaching to you all. I'm preaching to myself too that we must continuously go to the Lord and, and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways and that we would just follow him all the days. I promise you this, he will never lead you astray. That's a promise. And in a moment, we're going to have a time of commitment. Would you be bold enough, if you've never surrendered your life to that good shepherd, would you give your life to Jesus today? There's no better time. Molly Osborne, a precious, beautiful young girl, made her public profession of faith at the early service. So proud of this precious girl was not ashamed to come up and say, I've asked Jesus in my heart. Would you not be afraid or ashamed? Maybe you've been looking for a church family. Let me tell you, I believe God is still in control. God is still blessing. I still believe the best is yet to come. But the devil is trying his best to pull people away, to discourage you, to discourage me. And we don't want to give him that victory. Or maybe you're a Christian, you say, you know what, I've gotten so busy, God and my relationship with Christ and worship has fallen way down here. That's the only, we, we do all this, and whatever we have left over, if anything, we'll give it to him. Won't you put him up where he deserves to be today at the top? And watch how he'll begin to bless your life and give you his supernatural strength and grace Aren't you ready to come as we pray together? Lord, I pray right now in the stillness of this moment that if there are any men or women or young people here that have been so busy and overwhelmed and frazzled and frenzied, may they find rest for their soul in Christ. Lord, maybe there are folks that have been looking for a church we're not perfect. I'm not a perfect shepherd, but we do serve a perfect shepherd. And we're following your lead, Lord. Lord, maybe there are folks that are Christians, been members of the church, but they've stopped serving. They've stopped being active. Lord, bring them back. Let them know they are loved, they are missed, and they're important to us, and they're important to you. Oh God, continue to call us and may we hear your voice because we know the shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep recognize his voice. In Jesus' name, amen.